Uh, it's really good to be with all of you and have this discussion here. Um, well, I thought, you know, um, since we have quite a, can you all hear me? Since we have quite a wide canvas to cover, I thought we'd, um, as they say, uh, with any good story, we should begin at the beginning, uh, which is the birth of a story. And so I'd like to start by asking both my authors here. Uh, you know, a lot of the time when you finish reading a book, especially if it's a book which you've really enjoyed or the story has uh, really engaged you, you do wonder how did the author think of the story? How did it uh, take birth in the author's head? Uh, is it, has it come out of the author's own life experiences or things which, uh, or experiences which, uh, of other people that he has, he or she has uh, come across. Are the characters real based on real people or an amalgamation of real people, or are they totally imaginary? So uh, I'd like to start by asking, address this question first to you, uh, Istreen, because um, your stories, at least the three novels which I have read, uh, are basically based on uh, Naga myths and legends. Is that really the, uh, the sort of uh, field or the, um, the landscape for your stories? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, um, for the Speaking Tiger books, which I think you're familiar with, Renika. Yes. Uh, yes, I have taken as the kernel of the story from uh, a folk tale or a little a, a little snippet of a story and that inspired me so much that i wove around that mm -hmm. um, with with both son of the thundercloud and to run my love right. um, the, these were woven around folk tales and don't run my love was um, a, a story that my mother told me which actually is a meso story and then the story grew from that. Right. So it is myths and legends and tradition which has uh, fed these novels. But do you write, uh, uh, maybe not in English, but do you write or do you think you will ever write a contemporary novel about uh, set in Nagaland as it is today with contemporary characters? I'm writing books chronologically, so um, I have written about the first battle of resistance. That Sky is my father. With uh, now it's right. a speaking tiger imprint, and then I've written about the Japanese invasion right, of, okay. of the, via of India via the Naga Hills, and after that, um, terrible matriarchy and Bitter Wormwood. So I'm, I'm following this chronology. And my next book is about the post-war years. So it will touch contemporary society. <laughs> so it's basically with the, with the non-fiction that you go into contemporary times. Y yes. Nora, uh, you are interest an interesting mix of a uh, poet, uh, a novelist, and um, a non uh, a non-fiction writer who also does reportage. In fact, your latest book, The Business of Sex, is about the red light district. So there must be, I suppose, different inspirations which come to you at different times which drive the stories or the books that you write. Um, could you tell us a bit about how this happens? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, is this microphone? It works, right? Okay, at least until the seventh. <laughs> uh, so I think at the beginning of every book I write, there's a question that I ask myself or a question that uh, follows me for some time. Uh, and this question can be answered in different ways, uh, either in the way of, of a novel uh, or in the way of a uh, reportage, or also in the way of poetry. Uh, and then the, the direction in which I look to answer this question can be different. Either it can be a look in the history, uh, in the past, or to look in the, in the like, present, 
Uh, but still, I think that the present, of course, is connected with history. You cannot understand the society that is right now uh, around you without understanding where specific things come from. So uh, I wrote a book, for example, about an Italian, a German diplomat in Italy during the Second World War. That was my uh, attempt to get closer to this specific time that, of course, is very important to know and to know exactly and in detail to understand German history right now and to understand also German relationship uh, with other countries, uh, to understand international politics from the German view. Um, right now I'm writing about the United Nations, which again is like public, uh, like, like international relation uh, and about the global politics. That was to understand better what act exactly happens in Europe right now. We have, as you probably know, the new nationalistic turn, but still we have the, the global view uh, on the attempt to think politics globally, which my, uh, my point of view is the only way we can, we can handle it. So uh, I think these are questions I ask myself or questions that come to me, but then I need figures, protagonists, who get me through the story. So I always combine the theoretical or political questions with like a personal story. Let it be a family story, let it be a love story, something like that, so that you can, that, that these huge questions, what is a revolution, what is a change in politics, are mirrored in, in an in a emo uh, emotional sense. Yeah. And do you multitask in the sense that do you write in the space of one day uh, some poetry, a bit of a novel, <laughs> or, a, or a, a non-fiction book that you're writing on, or do you focus on one, um, one genre at a time? Actually, I focus on the novels, um, but I need some, some breaks. So right now I'm here because I needed a break from the novel, uh, and I uh, just let it uh, sleep at home and in that time I focus on other uh, other things like poetry, like uh, writing articles, writing columns, writing uh, reportages. So I think that the novel is kind of shaping my life <laughs> and I have to follow where it, w it will lead me. Well, um, Amitabh Bhakji, who hasn't been able to join us this uh, afternoon, had made an interesting comment recently when he said that I love Hindi, but I live English. And um, I found this with uh, many of the authors whom I have encountered, that uh, although their mother tongue may be Hindi or some other language, but when it comes to writing, then um, it's English that comes most naturally to them. Uh, and, uh, since we have with us uh, basically two bilingual or maybe trilingual authors. I'd like to ask you this question also. Uh, Eastream, uh, all the, the three novels that you've written have all been written in English, but um, I know you told, you told me that there are many Naga, Naga languages, and you did tell me the name of your particular language, which I'll never be able to pronounce, so I'll ask you to tell it to us. But um, that is the language which you grew up speaking and thinking in, right? Yes, yes, and uh, growing up in India as a child, one is multilingual without being aware yes. of it. Uh, but uh, at school, English was the medium of instruction for us. Uh, at home, we spoke our mother tongue, that was Tenyede. And uh, when writing, I write in English, mm -hmm. but when I'm writing my novels, my characters are speaking Naga English, if you want, their own sort of English, because I'm translating the thought patterns. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So your characters are speaking to you in your head in their own language, and you are really their, their translator, yes, <laughs> translating it into English as you, you write. You say that, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Nora, I know that you write in German, but um, do you also write in English, or do you feel that when it comes to writing, uh, German is the, uh, the only language that you 
Well, at the moment, it is uh, the only language because uh, I know it so deeply. I mean, I can go so deep into the language, into any syllable, that, that I uh, wouldn't be able to do that in English. Although, I mean, I can talk in English and I could write a short story in English. But still, it's, it's the, the material I work with and it's so connected with the language I grew up with. Uh, but whenever I stay in an English-speaking uh, country, uh, I start to think in English. And if, uh, probably if I would stay for six months or so, I would automatically start to write in English. But uh, that's why I always leave before <laughs> the six months are over. So. <laughs> But you have been translated into English and that um, brings me to the question that uh, when you've read translations of your work in English, um, how have you felt about them? Do you feel, uh, have you been happy with the translations that it's really true to your work? Because I know that translator is is really, uh, really plays a crucial role in, uh, you know, uh, presenting an author's work to a different audience and uh, there are times when authors uh, feel that you know the translation has not really conveyed what they want to say uh, how what has been your experience well it's very different uh, i mean if poems have been translated and that's always very difficult very difficult because you have to lose something but you can win something new that was not in the original text but that no, does not happen all the time it's, can be that you only lose something uh, and now I just read the, the last novel uh, that I published in German uh, that is translated into English and it's coming out in, in, in uh, Siegel books next year uh, and I read that uh, it was strange I was I was a bit um, I mean, I already knew the story. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, but uh, it was. On the other hand, it was fantastic to read it in a new tone. But I think it was it was getting me the sense of looking at my own work from a from a new perspective and seeing uh, things I would do different with the next book. But it was not the fault of the translator. But it was just like to see my own work from some distance and always it was good it was good to learn but that's an interesting point how a translation can sometimes um, hold up a mirror to your work and make you look at it from a different angle uh, but uh, talking about language I'd also like to ask both of you how important is language to you when you're writing I mean the actual words that you use which may seem um, uh, uh, somewhat um, uh, uh, difficult question, uh, I mean, a uh, sort of um, uh, strange question because obviously when you're telling a story, it's the words that you use that are the vehicle to tell the story and so obviously they must be important to you. But uh, what I wanted to ask you was that when you're actually writing the story, how important is the actual craft of writing it, as in, uh, you know, shaping the words, the, the sentences, the phrases. And um, I, uh, or do you, at that point, when you're first writing a story, is it the story which is more important? You just want to get it out on paper and then worry about, um, worry about the crafting of it. Eastreen, how, uh, may I address that to you first? Yeah. Um, for me, there are stages and or levels and levels of writing because uh, the story has to get out before I lose anything, before I forget anything. So the story comes out and then I keep it aside for some weeks and then uh, start editing, revising, editing. That's where I work on, on the language or grammar and all that. But... For me, the story has to get out the first. The story is important. Well, that's uh, interesting because speaking as an editor, I know that um, you many times when one gets a manuscript, one can immediately tell how much attention the author has actually paid to the craft. And um, uh, some, there are some manuscripts that where each sentence, each phrase, each word is beautifully crafted. 
And in the case of some authors, like I would mention Vikram Seth, where I don't think he ever has a word out of place or an unnecessary sentence. So in some cases it works beautifully, but in a, at times it doesn't work at all because once you've stopped admiring the writing and the, cra and the craft, then you realize that there, is, there really is not much of a story. The story is too thin. And on the other hand, one gets manuscripts where there really is a very good, a very compelling story buried somewhere underneath, but the author has not really paid much attention to how the story is structured and the language and so on. But those are the manuscripts which, which one is more inclined to accept because uh, one can all, as long as there is a story at the heart of it, one can always get to that but, and structure it and shape it. But if there isn't enough of a story, then there's not much one can do. So, uh, Nora, coming to you, when you're writing, uh, how much attention do you pay to uh, to the words and the crafting, or as Eastreen said, she, uh, for her, it's the story that's important, and then she goes back and worries about the, the rest of it. I think for me, it's connected. I I do a lot of research and <coughs> to to get the universe I'm talking about. Like for example, as, as I said, the United Nations. I was not. I didn't grow up at the United Nations, so I had to get into this cosmos. And um, but. When, when I get to that point, I need the language, and I need the language that for me fits to the, to the topic. So actually every novel has a bit of a different tone, a bit of a different style. Uh, and before I do find this specific style for, for the topic, I cannot really get closer to, to it. So it does not make, for me it does not make sense in my work to, to begin to write without paying attention, paying very much attention to the words. So it's, it's both intertwined. Right, okay. Um, before we get to um, stories that shape the world, one question I'd like to ask both of you is, how do the stories you write shape you? I mean, do you feel when you come to the end of each work, whether it's a novel or a, a poem, or, um, or a work of non-fiction, do you feel that each book has changed you or impacted your life in some way? Has, it, has that particular story shaped you in some way? Istreen? The, the answer I can immediately think of is that at the end of writing a book, I feel less arrogant. <laughs> You feel less arrogant. Why is that? Because I realize I'm, I still know so little and I, want, I, I need to know so much more. So, so that sense is overwhelming. <laughs> well, that's interesting because very often when I come to the end of editing a book, I also feel less arrogant because I realize when I've you know, read you know, how much the author knows, which I don't know, you know, it's, one learns uh, something new with every book. So it's interesting to know that uh, you should also feel the same way. Uh, Nora, how about you? Well, um, well, I will start to think that way. No, it's um, actually every book, yeah, of course, sh shapes, but also changes me. Um, and I cannot say what have become out of me if I would not have written these books. So they are so important steps in my life and in my biography that I even would say they're more important than things that happen to me in, as you say, real life or whatever you want to call that. Uh, so um, I think that when I finish a book, um, I, f I also feel a bit depressed because I got to know these characters so good as if we had a relationship or we, we lived together and then they're suddenly gone and I'm so 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 lonesome at one point. It's like an emptiness. Yeah, 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 it's terrible. So that's why I have to start a new uh, work again <laughs> immediately. <laughs> 
well that's easier than relationships because you know we start another book yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have just a few minutes left to talk about stories that shape the world and um, so i'll ask each of you in turn uh, which are the stories which in your mind have shaped the world or if not the world at least your world and why is that so i really liked uh, Maurice Farry's book, A Designate, A Designated Man. If you haven't read it, please read it for Christmas. Because it's so beautiful. Maurice is my friend, but it's not because of that. He writes about a feud in society, and the feud ends because the people discover love. And they discovered it in the most amazing ways, but I can't tell you how, because you have to read the story. Uh, yeah, I thought that was the most um, difficult uh, question to answer. <laughs> we knew before that this question would come up. And, I mean, there are so many books that I would like to name and then just, just t take one or two. Is, for me, it's just too difficult. So I will go to the poetry, which are not really stories, but I think for me are very influential and very important too. So I just named some some names that you might never have heard of, for example, Inga Christensen, which is a Scandinavian writer, author, poet, uh, but as well, uh, Derek Walcott or, uh, or Adam Sagievsky, there are some writers of the 20th century that for me had a very huge impact of, of my possibility, pos really possibility of seeing the world and just to change the view of things and to, to get a new sensitivity of, of yeah seeing the world so we have just a few minutes left if there are any questions and do say uh, do tell us which author you'd like to answer the question there's a hand there at the back is there anyone here with mics I think um, getting some mics. Now. Uh, hello, uh, my uh, question is to uh, Madam Eastern Kire. I read your book Bitter Wormwood. Um, when I was reading the book, I realized that the English language is very different from a mainstream English. Uh, literature of India. So, uh, how, I mean, do you think when you read, uh, write something like that, in that kind of a language, in that kind of an English, would it be accepted in a mainstream India? You know, because the language is so different. The English is so different. I don't think that's a problem anymore because look at what Arundhati did with her first book. Uh, it went on. That was Malayalam English. So, and English now uh, is such a malleable uh, language that everyone's borrowing from it and owning it. That, that's what I'm doing at my level. I'm owning it by turning it into Angami English or Naga English, if you will. So I'm not worried about it being accepted. Good evening, everyone. My question is to all of you. So, is there a key to developing the main conflicts in any story or novel? Sorry, we would get the question. Is there any key, any trick to develop the main conflicts in any story or book? I think, what, uh, what is it that helps you to develop a story? Or well, uh, I have to get to know the characters better. Actually, I mean, that's not a trick, that's not a key, that's just my own way of, of writing. Uh, just to write a lot, like write 50 pages that will never ever be published, just to get closer to the characters. And as I get closer to them, I get an idea of what their conflicts are. And of course, I think that you have to have maybe some relation yourself to these conflicts, otherwise you will not get close enough to it. Um, to add to that, I'll say that some of my characters are very feisty 
I don't know what they're going to do because suddenly they get <laughs> they start living a life of their own, and they totally surprise me. I think that's that's the secret. <laughs> I specifically don't have the uh, question to Nora, like Istreen can answer that too, but uh, the question is that uh, how Nora talked about that it is very therapeutic for her that uh, it is the way the characters came out of her. There was no other way that if she couldn't have written it, they, they wouldn't have, have come out of her. But if you think the other way, like what if uh, there is a depressing character, like there is something bad happening to the character, does it affect you in any way? Uh, w w what happens to through the character? Like if something bad is happening to the character, like if it is in conflict yeah. and you, it is in your mind, so does it affect you personally? Of, of, I mean, of course, uh, uh, I have characters, of, of course, all the time is, there are things happening that are not so nice because uh, the novels that talk about the tra tragedy are... More important than the the nice uh, stories. Uh, so, of course, I mean, for example, the the, the last novel uh, talks about Antonio Gramsci, which, who was a Italian Marxist during the 1920s, and he went to prison under the fascist regime. And uh, so, I had to every morning when I stood up, I had to actually go to this prison with him uh, because I had to get my imagination to this point and that was uh, that was not a nice time of my life though it was uh, of course better than his life was at that moment that's clear but still I mean you have to you have to stand by your character and uh, I think that is maybe the the most important thing that you just follow this character even if it does not feel very comfortable to be with him or her Yeah, uh, then, uh, this question is for Nora. Uh, you mentioned that your novels are a representation of a larger theme and that you use characters and plots to be able to represent this novel. Now, how is it that you go about uh, understand, getting, getting these characters? Do you research about a character or a plot and then you see these larger themes coming through the character in a novel? How does the entire approach of a narrative come, come about? Uh, well, as I said, uh, at the beginning there's a question, uh, a question of society more or less, or of history. And for example, Antonio Gramsci has a biography, so I really had to get close to it, read a lot of his work, uh, of letters, biographies, and so on. But um, then I have fictional characters, and they just, I have to have a conflict that shows the larger conflict. For example, in the United Nations, uh, novel, we have the conflict of a country where two groups of people want to think that they're legitimate are in this country, and there are conflicts and civil war and so on. And then I have like characters who are not in this conflict, but who show this conflict on a personal level, like the same the same thing, just much smaller, so that we can follow it a better way. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies, for such an informative insight into such a complex issue. Thank you so much for your time.